Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at the Polish Army Museum in Warsaw, taking a look at a couple extremely rare, very cool Polish small arms. Today we have a Błyskawica. This is the iconic submachine gun manufactured uh, underground clandestinely in Warsaw, uh, originally for Operation Tempest, the, uh, the Polish Home Army series of uprisings to basically liberate Poland right in front of the advancing Red Army. That didn't work out. We'll get to that in a few minutes. What's particularly interesting to me about this, aside from the fact, well, several different things. First off, this is, as far as I know, the most successful clandestine manufactured submachine gun of modern history. Um, there were very, you know, there are various uh, groups that made Sten guns. This was made in very substantial numbers as an indigenous, unique design, and actually successfully produced during wartime, during occupation, and that's extremely unusual. Most of the projects like this result in a couple of one-off guns. Um, and the, the Home Army in Warsaw produced some 750 of these. This is also, interestingly, Poland's first mass production submachine gun, because they had worked on developing and adopting a submachine gun prior to World War II, and it never really got into mass production. In fact, uh, I have a video coming on that. That's the WZ-39 uh, Moors. But that didn't get adopted, and so instead, the first actual production submachine gun is the Buskowitza. So, uh, the backstory on this is uh, submachine guns, of course, everyone realized, became very useful, very effective uh, weapons for modern warfare in World War II. There were a bunch of countries who didn't really recognize the potential. Great Britain, for example, before the war. Once fighting starts, people realize submachine guns are fantastic weapons. Uh, and this, of course, applies equally well to clandestine armies like the Polish Home Army, operating underground, uh, maintaining forces of saboteurs, and preparing for an uprising against the German occupiers when the Red Army gets close enough to support such an uprising. So uh, in 1942, in September of 1942, a pair of Polish engineers by the name of Zawrotny and Velenier uh, decide to, that they can come up with a submachine gun design. Neither of these guys has any previous arms design experience, but they are both engineers. One of them was actually working in an ammunition factory, so they've got some context for firearms. And they've got a couple of guns to use as inspiration, as, as examples, those being primarily the Sten and the MP40, two guns that, that are accessible in Poland. And there are pros and cons to both. So the Sten is economical to manufacture, but it's not the world's most ergonomic submachine gun, as you may have discovered if you looked at one. And the manufacturing methods, while efficient, are not necessarily well suited to the specific uh, manufacturing facilities that are available in Warsaw to the Home Army. Remember, this all has to be done under occupation, under, under severe restrictions. So not just a matter of, oh, there's some German soldiers walking around so we can't cart you know, loads of submachine gun barrels across the street. But control to the level of machine tools are registered and their, their use is, is limited, their distribution is limited. You have to have an, uh, an appropriate reason from the German authorities to have a mill or cutting tools. So with that in mind, how do we manufacture a Sten gun? Well, some of the parts aren't going to be that easy to do. Uh, similarly, the MP40 is a gun that has a lot of a lot better characteristics in many ways. It's a much more comfortable gun to fire. It's a more uh, easily concealed gun with the folding stock. But of course, the MP40 is a gun that requires sophisticated manufacturing techniques. So. These two engineers uh, appeal to the home, home Army for permission to develop their own submachine gun. And they're granted permission, and over the course of about six months, they put together a design for the Buscovitsa, combining the concealability elements of the MP40 with the, con the manufacturing concepts of the Sten, but specifically applied in a way that can be done underground in Warsaw. By April of 43, they have a design. By September of 43, they have their first actual working prototype. And it's worth pointing out that the Home Army at this point was also 
uh, pursuing projects to copy, uh, manufacture copies of the Sten gun. And they had already set up manufacture of Sten gun barrels and magazines. So it was decided for the Buscovitsa to use that barrel and magazine design. It doesn't make sense to duplicate the effort on parts that are that complicated. For the very first prototype they actually pulled the magazine and the barrel out of a British manufactured air dropped Sten gun. Now before we take a close look, I think it's worth pointing out for a moment that there is good reason to man for the Poles to be manufacturing their own guns instead of simply getting airdrop resistance supplies from the British. Uh, there were a lot of Sten guns that were dropped into France. It didn't necessarily make sense for the French to try and develop their entire own clandestine arms manufacturing program. The problem is it's quite a lot farther to get to Poland from airfields in Britain than it is to get to France. And there simply weren't very many airdropped Sten guns coming into Poland. It wasn't practical, uh, not at all practical, until capture of airfields in Italy later in the war. And even then there wasn't a whole lot of resistance support being dropped to the, the Polish home army. So that's why they're developing their own programs. And with that in mind, let's take a look at how they actually designed this and how they built it. All right, so here's the overall gun. And what we have here, uh, as you can see, is a combination of basically Sten and MP40 characteristics. A uh, very simple tube manufacture, Sten magazine, a Sten style of magazine well. We have an underfolding stock, uh, completely inspired by the MP40. So that is going to fold under like so. The locking mechanism on this one is rather a bit loose, but you push the button in and that lifts this up out of position and you can then pull the stock down. Now the length of pull on this stock is ridiculously short and it was designed that way specifically because that's how long they could make it before it ran into the magazine well. Remember the guys who were designing this were engineers but they didn't have any specific firearm experience and they couldn't exactly hop on the internet or you know, drive over to Vienna to inspect a nice arms collection in some museum. And so you end up with some design elements like this that are not exactly ideal. But interestingly you also end up with some creative interesting elements that we don't see on other firearms where maybe it's not the best idea but you look at it and you go, huh, well that's interesting, specifically the safety. So the safety mechanism on this is this front, uh, what looks like a backwards trigger. If I don't pull that, the trigger is locked. And so that acts as a drop safety. If you drop this thing on the butt of the gun, uh, yes, the trigger it, uh, momentum will pull the trigger back, but it also locks this safety lever in place and acts as a functional drop safety. In order to fire the thing, you literally just force your finger between these two levers, that pushes the safety forward, which unlocks the trigger and allows you to fire. That's a mechanism that I don't think I have seen anywhere else, and it's not a terrible idea. A couple other distinctive elements, probably the most distinctive element on here are the three lightning bolts on the butt plate. Uh, Buscovitsa means lightning. Lightning bolts represent that sort of. Uh, this, these butt plates, which you'll notice are cast parts, which you would think would be a rather complicated way to make a part that doesn't need to be that complicated. Well, these were made by a company that made cast electric oven handles. And so the design of this butt plate is intended to look quite a lot like the oven handles that this company was already making. They were already set up for aluminum casting. So manufacture of this part was actually something that was well, well within the capabilities of of uh, the, the Buscovitsa team. And then you of course have the, the lightning bolts which are the company logo. Uh, they made electric ovens, so uh, a couple of synchronicities there. The other most distinctive element on the gun is this aluminum barrel shroud slash barrel nut. And it's distinctive. You can see it in a lot of photographs. It sticks out because it's a light colored component. And this is another good example of uh, something that maybe seems like a good idea on paper, if the designers had more practical experience with firearms design they would have realized it's not such a great idea. Uh, the intention was to pull heat out of the barrel and uh, radiate it off the gun. Well, in practical terms the home army didn't have access to enough ammunition to get the guns hot enough 
to actually need that in any way. And the, uh, the problem that this piece represents is that it is solid aluminum, and it's threaded in here, and so your threads are aluminum threads into a steel receiver tube, and this acts as the barrel nut that holds the barrel in place. So every time the gun fires, the breech block is slamming into the barrel, which then directly slams into the... It, it's this threading that's holding the barrel in place, and so you run the risk, and reality over time, of uh, the aluminum threads being stripped off, the barrel nut failing and coming off the front of the gun. So uh, some of the later production guns were actually made with a replacement style of steel barrel nut instead of this aluminum piece. Uh, this particular one is a reproduction. Um, either this one didn't have an aluminum shroud in the first place, or it, it just didn't survive storage. Uh, these guns had a rough life, understandably. Finally, one of the other design elements that we see on the Buscovitzas is excessive use of screws. There aren't a lot of spring latches, there aren't a lot of quick disconnect sort of catches, there are a lot of threads and screws. And that is simply because of what was available to, uh, to the team for actual manufacturing. Um, threads and screws are pretty easy to do, and the, the consequence is the gun is rather cumbersome to disassemble, but that is an acceptable trade-off in the circumstances where it was being built. So to disassemble it, we're going to start with this screw on the back. Uh, the lower assembly is sort of a modular removable piece. So we've got that, and then we've got this screw holding on the lower. Take that out. And then our lower assembly is going to slide off here. There is the, the rear end cap of the receiver has a dovetail slot in it. There's a matching dovetail on this uh, block. This is also, by the way, the rear sight. Little tiny peephole, again, uh, design inspiration from the Sten without a lot of practical firearms experience to give the designers an idea of whether that's actually the best sort of sight to use or not. Next up, on the lower, we actually have uh, like a cassette unitized trigger assembly, which another one of those things where this was uh, this was done by some engineers without firearms experience, and you know the rear sight they came up with not so great. This concept quite good. So this screw holds the trigger guard in place. Let's pop that out, and then. actually looks rather HK-like there. But uh, there's, your, there's your sear. Pull the trigger back, the sear drops. Uh, and this allows, this is another one of those elements of manufacture where this doesn't look anything like a firearm part uh, to the untrained eye. And this can be made in one shop, this can be made in another shop, and then it all gets assembled together. Uh, interestingly, by the way, this is the first use of a rear aperture sight by any Polish military firearm. Moving forward, let's come back to the barrel nut here. We can unthread this. That comes off. Very much a Sten style of barrel nut. And then pull the barrel out. So there's your barrel. And these were actually manufactured by the Home Army uh, for both the Buscovitsa and for Sten copies. Now we can actually take the bolt out of the gun. With the trigger group removed, we can unscrew the rear end cap. And lo and behold, we have a dual nested recoil spring system. Another uh, good idea arrived at without a lot of firearms experience to tell them that it was a good idea. These were clearly reasonably talented engineers uh, who were in a, a highly restricted situation. Now the bolt handle is held in place by another screw. With that screw out, the bolt handle simply slides back and in. And we can take out the bolt. Note that there are a series of ridges 
on the bolt. This is a design feature that was taken from the MP40. On the MP40, these ridges are built into the receiver tube, and the idea is to minimize the surface area um, in contact between the bolt and the receiver to reduce friction. If dirt gets into the gun, it gives a place for the dirt to, to move and not, uh, not prevent the gun from functioning. Well, putting flutes like this into the receiver tube is quite complicated, and wasn't something that the Poles were able to do with their limited facilities, but cutting them onto the bolt was possible, and so they simply reversed the setup and got the same benefit. This is a simple fixed firing pin, uh, ejector there, really nothing else to it, just a simple blowback heavy bolt, 9mm Parabellum submachine gun. And our last element here is the magazine well. Another screw off. And then there's your magazine well, the magazine release button right there, the ejector right there, and a loop for a sling. Again, in the interest of reliability and dirt and grit control, the front of the bolt is beveled back right here, and in fact the breech, the breech block on the inside, is beveled forward. So you have this rather large V-shaped space between the bolt face and the breech face up here, which gives plenty of space for dirt and powder fouling to accumulate uh, between cleanings without the gun um, actually suffering as a result. In fact, if we look a little bit closer up at the front of the receiver, we essentially have a front trunnion here that was originally threaded in. It's a little hard to see, but in that little gap down there, there are threads where this front trunnion was originally threaded in place. It's permanently fixed in there. We think there's a screw that was threaded in and then filed flat uh, and, and polished flat. That's The trunnion is not removable. Uh, and then there's your front sight, which is on this ring that's threaded in place to hold the trunnion in. The barrel then sits inside there, and the barrel nut screws into this to clamp the barrel in place. And there is the whole thing completely uh, detail stripped. So there's there's your Bruskovica. This is not a field stripping assembly that you would do all that often. Uh, certainly not something you would do really quickly in the field, just because of the number of screws involved. So the first prototype Bruskovica was complete and ready in September of 1943. But it hadn't actually been test fired, because of course it was manufactured in an occupied city. It's a little awkward to be test firing submachine guns. And so the adoption trials were actually also the very first test firing of the gun. A uh, couple of home army guys, two engineers, get in a car, drive outside of Warsaw into the forest, and set up to test fire the gun. The initial shooting went rather poorly. Uh, it really didn't run very well at all. It took a couple hours of tinkering, filing, tweaking the mechanism before they are able to get the gun uh, fully functional. They're able to uh, ultimately make a successful complete magazine dump, at which point the Home Army approves the design for production. The initial order placed was for a uh, thousand guns. That was quickly followed by a supplement for another 300 guns, and uh, production got underway. This was done uh, manufacturer parts was dispersed across the city in order to basically so that every uh, every individual part could be made in a separate factory or a separate workshop to allay suspicion. You have a lot of parts that do not look like gun parts here. So 20 plus different workshops uh, were put to work making the various parts. Uh, those are brought together in what was in fact a chicken wire factory for final assembly. They dug some tunnels underneath the factory, linking up with the crypts under a church, built themselves a firing range to test fire the guns. This was a, a very involved, significant uh, production. And ultimately, by July of 1944, uh, some 700 guns had been manufactured. This is, again, this is a huge feat of clandestine serial production. Not one guy in a, in a forge making one gun at a time, but actual serial production. Now, what happened to those guns is interesting. There's, these weren't just being handed out willy-nilly to resistance cells. There was a very specific plan in, in place, and that was the Buscovica was going to be the, the mobilization weapon for the home army 
at, for what was Operation Tempest. And this was a plan to basically run a, a rolling series of uprisings in front of the advancing Red Army to give the Home Army uh, an active hand in the liberation of Poland. They did not want the Red Army to march in and be able to claim that they single-handedly liberated the country and now probably own it. They, they wanted to have you know, be active in the liberation themselves. Frankly, you see the same thing with the French, uh, the French efforts to be an active part of the liberation of France with the Allied armies in France. It went a little better for the French. So, uh, six hundred of the guns were packed up and shipped to the east of Poland in preparation for this operation. The, in fact, they were specifically prohibited from being used in the vicinity of Warsaw in order to prevent the Germans from starting from getting any suspicions that there might be mass production of guns in Warsaw, which worked. The, there was never any suspicion of it. Uh, however, before Tempest could really get going, well, at the beginning of this uh, plan, one of the very first cities that that this was going to take place with was Vilnius uh, in what is now Lithuania. Well. The Poles revolted in front of the Red Army. The Red Army captures Vilnius. The, the Home Army and the Russian Army get along very well. Uh, Frontline troops for the first couple of days, then the Russian troops move, continue advancing, and the city is occupied by the NKVD, who promptly uh, sweep through in the night, arrest all the Home Army soldiers, and ship them off to Siberia as German collaborators. Uh, not cool. but. Uh, this is a pattern that would be repeated as the Russians advanced west, and understandably it sort of dulled Polish enthusiasm to help out the Red Army. And so Operation Tempest didn't ever really happen. You, you really see the, the final iteration of this with the Warsaw Uprising, where they waited until the Red Army was right on the, the Vistula River, right outside of Warsaw, uh, rose up against the Germans, and the Russians immediately stopped and politely waited for the Germans to demolish the Home Army before advancing into the city. So uh, what's interesting, we've got 700 Wiskovitsas that were manufactured. The significant majority of them allegedly, in theory, they were supposed, like the records show that they were supposed to be shipped to the east. Those guns have never actually been found. There isn't evidence of where they ended up. The guns that did survive, that we see in photographs and that are responsible for examples like this one and about the other dozen that still survive today, are a combination of the remaining 100 guns that uh, were never shipped out and stayed in Warsaw proper, and then about another 50 guns that were manufactured after the beginning of the Warsaw Uprising. At that point, it is rather less important to stay clandestine because there's an active uprising going on, and so uh, the last batch of guns that could be made from the available parts were put together, and that accounted for about another 50 guns. A lot of those were made without the aluminum barrel nuts, you know, sort of kind of some last minute manufacture. But those are the guns that account for the, the surviving examples and the photographic evidence. Uh, and they were, in fact, used in the Warsaw Uprising. So uh, that, I think, is the story of perhaps the, well, almost certainly the most successful clandestine manufactured um, underground submachine gun of World War II. Uh, I would like to give a big thanks to the Polish Army Museum for giving me access to this uh, example to film for you guys. If you are in Warsaw, definitely make some time to stop by and check out the museum. Uh, they are in the process of moving to a new location that should be really particularly excellent, although I don't know exactly when that transition is going to happen. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.